time. Uh, I want to extend a very warm welcome. And um, my heart this morning is not to give you information about God. You can find that on Google. <laughs> my heart this morning, my prayer that this morning is that you would encounter the presence of the Lord for your own self. Maybe during the time of worship, you've, you've felt something in your heart that you've never experienced before. That's the presence of the Lord touching your life. And uh, when the Lord touches your life and when you respond to His touch, your life will never, ever be the same. Your life cannot be the same. There's people here today, your lives have been transformed, not because of information about God, but because His love touched your heart and that you responded. And so this morning, I want to share about the presence of the Lord. Hello. It's the greatest thing that you can ever have around your life is the presence of God. A lot of people know about God. Even the devil knows the scripture, but he's still a devil. Just because you know a lot of information about God doesn't mean literally. But you know his presence, you know his touch, you know his hand upon your life. Well, that just changes everything. And more than anything else in the world, this morning, if it was the last thing I ever saw, ever, ever spoke to you, that you could experience the presence of God in your heart, in your soul. This is what all this is about. The lights, the everything. This is what this church is about. Not that you would have information about God, not just that, but you would experience His love and kindness, that you would experience His, His presence around your life, and that your life, that your destiny would, that would, that would turn. And maybe that you have different ideas about what God is like. And I pray that this morning, as I open up the Scripture, that your eyes will be open to what God is truly like. And I want to just uh, open it up here and, and uh, Genesis chapter 28. It's the story of Jacob, and uh, who eventually became Israel. Jacob, the very name means deceiver or tricker, or somebody who's uh, uh, or a heel grabber. And he had a significant issue with his his brother Esau. He cheated his brother, cheated his. Thank you guys. Cheated his brother out of his birthright. He was a cheat. He was a lying, low down son of a gun. But yet God touched his life. He had an experience with the presence of God that transformed him. And that same God that transformed Jacob's life, even though he was a lying and a cheating toad, he can touch your life. Not to say that you're lying, cheating toads, but it doesn't. The point being is that wherever you are in your life, that God can touch you when you respond to his touch. Something changes. And so he had basically had to leave. And it says and starts up in chapter, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Bathsheba and he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. Thanks, guys. Because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it on his head. And he lay down on that place to sleep. In other words, he was wandering through the desert. In the middle of the desert, he was tired. The sun had set. And he got to a certain place, a particular place in his journey where he was tired. And it's kind of a strange thing to find a, a, a rock for a pillow. It's kind of like, hello. And then he go, it goes on to say, and he fell asleep. And in that place, he, and then he, in, in, verse, in verse 12, it says, then he dreamed. He closed his eyes and went to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. In his dream, he saw a ladder. And on its top, reached to the heavens, and there were angels of God that were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. And also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the east and the west, the west and the east, and the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families or all the generations of the earth shall be blessed. Somebody say, in me. Amen. Somebody say, it's in me. Amen. And behold, I am with you. Somebody say, I, he is with me. Amen. I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land or bring you back to this place. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Come on, if you want to give Jesus some praise. 
And then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and this is where I want to preach from this morning. He awoke from his sleep. He came to, he opened his eyes and said, surely, another version says, without doubt. Hello? Just in case you're a little bit upset about my Irish team beating the All Blacks. I know some of you may be still a bit stunned about that, but I'm proud to be Irish today. Surely the Lord, without doubt, God is in this place. And I did not know it. What a crazy thing to say. Surely, without doubt, God is in this place. And I did not know it. In fact, he was here, and I nearly missed him. And then he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? Somebody say, this place is awesome. I can't hear you. This place is awesome. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Somebody say, the gate of heaven. If there is ever a time in the world today that the gates of heaven needs to be open, it is now. Some of you are excited. Amazing this, Jacob is on a journey, he's far away from home in the middle of the desert with only rocks for a pillow, there was no air conditioning, there's no nothing, and he lies down and has a sleep, and the sleep in the middle of this encounter, in the middle of the desert, there's no air con, there's no water bed, there is no absolutely nothing, it's just a rock for a pillow, in the middle of the nowhere, in the middle of the desert where there is no water, there is no life, in the middle of the desert. He has an encounter with the Lord that changes his life forever. Friends, it doesn't matter where you are in your life. You may not be in a a natural desert right now, but you may be in a spiritual, emotional desert. You may be in a financial desert. You may have nothing in your life except for a pile of rocks to lay your head. Friend, it doesn't matter where you are in your life in this place this morning. This place, wherever you are, can be a moment that changes your life forever. I don't know about you, but that is what I want. I've had a relatively good life. I've had some struggles, but I want my life to be transformed forever. I want the nations of the earth to be blessed because I held on to the promise of God. I want my life to be the gate of heaven, not the gate of hell. Hello? You're with me this morning. Strikes me in this ladder, in this dream, he sees, in the dream, he sees the ladder with angels ascending and descending and descending. This is the initial encounter, I guess, when you come to a church like this. This is why we do what we do. It's not about just coming and clapping some songs and listening to somebody rattle on about. It's it's much more than that. This is where the origins of what we know as church started. This initial encounter with what was known then as the house of God would one day become the synagogue and the first dream of a gate of heaven that would allow people to know that there was a God up there, but he was not just up there. He was far closer than you could ever, ever imagine. What strikes me is this, is Jacob's response after his encounter. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but if, when P- Apostle Tamarit was here the other day and talking to some of the people, listening to her minister, their response was this, I have never, ever seen anything like that before. I mean, for some of us, you, you, you may have been, if you weren't here, that's okay. Uh, you may have been amazed at that, the fact that a man from another country could call details, your name, your last name, your first name, your last name, details about your family and not knowing. I think for me personally, one of the things that impacted me the most was how close the presence of God truly is. What strikes me is this. After experiencing the presence of God so close and having such an encounter with God, that people's life could go away and never change. 
pray, God, God, touch me, touch my life. Lord, let me know that you are real somewhere. And then he comes and demonstrates his goodness, and then nothing changes in your life. My question is, what, is it, what would it take for you to change? What would it take to bring you to your knees in the place of repentance? What would it take for your life to turn around and your destiny to change? What would it take? What strikes me again is this response after his, it says, first, of, first thing, he awoke. When, when, when you awake, you, uh, you come out, your, your awareness shifts. There is something about you that comes alive. One of the first things when you encounter, come out from a, an encounter with the presence of the Lord is something in you comes alive. There is something about being in the presence of God. If you have been in the presence of God, you do not come out with a frown on your face. God is a happy God. The Bible clearly says that he who sits in the heavens laughs. If you think he's angry, you're listening to the wrong God. He ain't angry with you. He loves you. He's happy. He's more happier than you think. In other words, they say, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it, or in other words, I did not realize it, or I was not aware of it. How could the presence of God, of such a wonderful and powerful God, how could I be so close to his presence and just not realize it? Even with Jesus Christ, he walked through some places. He walked through the city of Jericho, walked in and walked out, like Pastor Kate talked about. No one got touched. The Son of God walked through your midst and no one knew. Nothing happened, nothing changed. It strikes me. And I started to do a little bit of research and I started to ask some questions. One, why wasn't he aware of the presence of God? Why not? Why wasn't he aware of such the presence of an amazing, wonderful, and almighty God? Why wasn't he aware? What caused him to miss the presence of God? Another question I came up with was, well, if he wasn't aware of the presence of God, what was he aware of? Was he more aware of the rock underneath his head? Or the fact that there's a couple of rocks underneath it? What was he aware of? What was it that he was more aware of then than the presence of God? If he was so close and he missed it, why? What was he aware? And then I started to change the question. In other words, this. How do I come to a place? How do I come to know that God is in this place? Because I don't ever want to live my life and miss the presence of God. I want to know more than anything else in the world. Anything else. How do I get to the place where I know that the presence of God is here? I don't know about you, but that would be a life-changing moment. Some people, the idea of church or the idea of the presence of God is for an hour and a half, maybe if the preacher's a bit too excited, we go for two hours, but... Uh, basically within that time frame in, the, in, in our week that we come to the building and there we, we, we meet the, the presence of God and we, we clap, some, clap our hands and sing some songs anyway and then we move away and apart from that else, I don't know what else happens during the week. Friends, that is not the purpose of church. God's plan. There was no church building with nice lights and air conditioning and a drum set and a nice keyboard. He was in the middle of the desert. Nothing. Zippity bop, Nothing. And he had a life and counting and change. He was on a journey. He was in a place of pain. And on that place, that's where he encountered the Lord. If he can encounter the Lord and the presence of the Lord in that place, so can you in this beautiful facility. How do I come to know, not in here, but in here, that God is in this place? And obviously the second question is, following that, is where exactly is this place? Where? One, I want to know how, and I want to know where. Don't BS me. (laughs) I want to know how and where do I get the presence of God around my life. If you look at the original translation, 
It says, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, and I did not wear of it. If we were to translate it, let's bring up the translation again. What, what happens is sometimes when, obviously we read the Bible in English and there's some translation, they, they try and get the, basically the, the original meaning. But when you catch it, the original way it was written was not in English. They didn't have English words back there. They had Hebrew words. It was originally written in Hebrew. So in order to understand it, you have to go back to the translation and retranslate it back into English. So when you look at the way that it was written, there's a couple of words I won't explain them to you right now, but the way that it is, if you translate what it is written in Hebrew literally into English, it is said like this. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I, notice the comma, I did not know it. Or notice in the first translation it says, and I wasn't aware of it, or I didn't know it. If you take the original translation and you translate it literally, it comes to this. It may be a small difference, but it actually it's a big difference. There was no accident. Nothing is just written by randomness in the Scripture. Everything is important. That The fact is that there are two eyes and I. So basically he's saying is this. The, surely the Lord is in this place and I. I knew it not. Notice the two eyes. Not those eyes. <laughs> to translate it sh- accurately, we'd have to say, why, and the question is, why the double eye? Why not just a single eye? This is maybe just be very trivial, but actually, when you understand Scripture, everything is important. Details are important. I, pause. I didn't know it. The question of, one, how do I know the presence of God? And that where is the presence of God? You'll find that it's in the eye. Hello? Listen to this. Where was the presence of God? Just think about it. Just read it. Where did God, where did Jacob encounter the presence of God? Was it in a physical space? Some people might interpret it, yes, it was in a physical space in that point, in this particular GPS mark. But actually, when you think about it, where did he encounter the presence of God? In a dream. One of the things, the most amazing revelation is this I, I discovered. The place where Jacob found God was in his heart. It was within the I, within the self, within his heart, within, and here was where he discovered God. Sure, in the dream, he saw that God was way up there. But yes, God is up there and around us, but he is also in our heart. What makes it striking is this, that here we have a man who had just cheated his brother. He was on the run from his angry brother in the middle of the desert. He was fearful and alone, and he was a, he was a fraudster. He was a tricker. He was a deceitful man. And in the midst of that, in the midst of his failure, in the midst of his journey, in the midst of his fear, in the midst of the desert, the cold desert, in the midst of his failings, in the midst of the fact that he, he was addicted. I mean, I'm just ad-libbing a little bit. Just to illustrate a point for you. The fact is that in the midst of his struggles, Maybe it's in the midst of a divorce. Maybe it's in the midst of your addiction. Maybe it's in the midst of your business failure. Maybe it's in the midst of your family breakdown because this is what this man had felt. He had just cheated his brother and his brother was as angry as a giant hornet and he was going to come and just pound him if he could. It's in that space. And the eye, the eye, not just the good eye, not just, I mean, look, all of us who are, aware of things in our heart that aren't right. But it was in that place, in the midst of his brokenness, in the midst of his failure, in the midst of all that, he discovers the presence of God in his heart. First of all, friends, I want to encourage you, it doesn't matter where you are on your journey in life today. 
It doesn't matter how far you have failed. It doesn't matter what has been done against you. It doesn't matter what mistake that you have made. It doesn't matter how you've messed up. It doesn't matter if you're a lying, cheating son of a gun. Friends, if you just understand this, that is where he found the presence of God in his heart. Friends, he is not afraid. God is not afraid of your failures. He is not afraid of the fact that you kicked the dog and swore a few things. It doesn't matter. He, it's in his heart. In the midst of the good, the bad, and the ugly, that is where he found the presence of God. Religion would say, you've got to have this, 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 this right in order for you to encounter the presence of God, if you're lucky. According to Scripture, Jacob, in the midst of his failure, found the presence of God in his heart. Friends, if Jacob could find the presence in his heart and became aware of the presence in his heart, then you can too. He became aware that, yes, that God is sitting in the heavens, but he also wants to reside and make our heart his home. Friends, he wants you to make your heart his home today. The second part, he also, and amazing that Tamara had also preached this. He said, uh, one of the verses that Apostle Tamara brought out was this, that the same spirit who lives, the same spirit who rose Jesus Christ from the dead lives within us. What strikes me is this is a previous dispensation that it's not until thousands of years later that people became aware that the presence of God could live in us. But yet here, Jacob found a revelation far beyond his time that the presence of God could live in his heart. And the second point, though, is his two eyes. At the very moment, becomes, he becomes aware of God's presence. He says, I, or in other words, the self, and, and, and it's almost like a complete opposite of what I've just spoken. And this is the irony of why there's two eyes. One, he discovered that the presence of God is in him, but also the very thing that holds the presence of God was also the very thing that stopped him becoming aware of the presence of God. Hello? Look, some of you got your arms folded. Some of you are just maybe a little bit sleepy. This something here is something that you could capture your life. If you got a hold of this and wrote it in your heart, it could transform your life. Don't forget it. Don't let it just go past your head and forget about it. This is a moment that could transform your life. In the very moment that Jacob becomes aware of God's presence, he says, I, or I did not know. And here is the way that we can become more aware of the presence of God. It's not by praying harder. It's not by doing a whole bunch of other things. It is simply by this. It's only when we become less aware of I that we become more aware of him. There's a few claps behind there. If you are struggling to one, to understand that the presence of God lives inside of your heart, despite all your failures, then you need a fresh encounter with the Lord. The very place that he wants to live, if we are so consumed with the eye, we miss the presence of the, God, presence of the Lord. When we stop thinking of so much of ourselves and what's going on in and around our life, that we become more of the presence of God in us and around us. Look, as a pastor, pastor of the church, one of the greatest challenges I would face is being busy doing other things. And in the busyness of doing all of these important things, administration work, things, da, 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 yeah, to stop and become aware that actually I'm a minister of God. I am a minister of His presence. The more I become aware of His presence wanting to live inside of me, despite all my failures, the more I become less aware of me and all the things that are going on around. You'll find that there's many pressures. There's lots of jobs that need to be done. There's business pressures, there's financial pressures, there's family pressures. There's a whole bunch of things that are weigh on your heart and weigh on your mind. 
How many people know what I'm talking about? So many people can come so caught up with their own spirituality. I know this. I know how to do that. I know I'm, I'm gifted at this. Look, forget all that. The most important thing ever, above all else, is to know one that despite your failings, that the presence of God wants to make His home in your heart. Second thing, the thing that stops us from receiving that presence is that we're so caught up in ourselves. Maybe you're busy in life. Maybe you've got a whole bunch of really, really important things to do. (laughs) We all have. It's amazing how self-centered we become. So many other things have our attention that we miss out on the most amazing thing. To me, it reminds me of how close His presence His presence is. And how easy it is to say, I didn't know that you were there. It's one thing to come in a place of worship and hear and experience the presence of God. It's another thing to carry that presence into the world around us. It's another thing to be aware in your business, be aware in your family life, be aware in your finances, that wherever I am, that is where the presence of God is that when I'm talking to people, I become aware of the presence of God in and around me. So many things are so important, but nothing else can be as important as experiencing His presence in His heart, in our heart. Essentially, this is, I'm just going to kind of just wrap it up a little bit here, but it says, this is what sin is and why repentance is so important. I was just thinking about the idea of sin and repentance. And often our understanding of sin and repentance is more about doing something wrong. And repentance implies then that we are forgiven from the punishment of our sin. The problem with that is this, is that often we can look around and look at our lives and think, well, I'm not really doing anything really bad. There's not major sin that I'm aware of, I mean, I'm not. And then you, you know you need to live in a place of repentance you're not quite sure what you need to be repenting from. (laughs) Well, that's how I felt anyway. Look, I'm not perfect and I'm not aware of any major sin issues in my life. I say some things I shouldn't say. (laughs) A couple of occasions I, you know, I swear. (laughs) Hopefully the neighbours didn't hear it too clearly. You may be struggling with some things. Maybe it's on the old cigarettes or something like that. Whatever. And here you Sorry, God, for smoking that cigarette. And next thing you know, you've got another one. It's like, oh, live up in a perpetual cycle of guilt. But hear me this. Yes, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not good for you to do that. But more than that, regardless of whether you smoke or don't, the fact is the Lord still wants to make His home in your heart. The fact that you take a cigarette doesn't stop the presence of God moving in and through your life. Because you say a few words that you maybe you shouldn't do, it doesn't stop the presence of God moving through your life. Because you do a few masks, make a few gestures at somebody on the road. <laughs> Don't let that guilt of thinking that your life is full of these sins that you think God's angry with you. No. He's aware of all of that. He gave the birdie to somebody and told them they were, what the heck? God, now you're not going to use me. No, no, no. He uses you in spite of all of that. In spite, that's why He's such a wonderful and gracious God. The sin that the place of repentance, I believe, for me personally, I've come to is this. It's the sin of I. It's the sin of being so filled up with my own self-importance. So filled up with all these jobs that need to be done or these things that need to happen or these trivial things that are around our life. I get so occupied with faults and struggles, things that need to be done, and that is what hinders the presence, awareness of His presence in and around my life. In the same way in Galatians 2.20 it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ 
who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe this. That Jacob had a life-changing, life-transforming moment. It wasn't in a flash building. It was in the middle of a desert with a stone for a pillow. Just cheated his brother who was wanted to beat the heck out of him. Alone and afraid, doesn't really know where he was going to. And it was that place. The Lord spoke to him. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. How awesome is this place? Obvious question is, well, what's the place? It's you. It wasn't the pile of stones in the middle of the desert that was the awesome place. It's you. You are awesome. It doesn't matter what failure you may have experienced. It doesn't matter what's going on inside of your heart. You are with a place in the midst of the good, the bad, the ugly, even with that cigarette, or maybe if you're really bad, that little joint, the sweet cigarette, whatever. You are the place. And I'm not condoning smoking or anything like that. What I want you to get is this, that far beyond all of that, the greatest thing that you can have in your life is amongst all that, that the presence of God abides in your heart and that you are awesome. Now the building's pretty cool. But it's you. Awesome is this place, none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. It's you that's the gate of heaven. It's you who God thinks are awesome, is awesome, are awesome, whatever. It's you. Tell somebody next to you, you are awesome. You are none other than the house of God. It is you that is the gate of heaven, not this building. The building is nice, but it's just a bit of this and a bit of that, polished up pretty nice. But it's you who is awesome. In spite of your journey, in spite of where you are right now, it's you that's awesome. It's you. That's the house of God. And it's you that is the gate of heaven. That is why we need repentance, because this, when we are more aware of our failings, when we're more aware of our own self-importance, what happens is that gate closes up. But the more you become aware of the presence of God in and around your life, the more the gate of your heart will open up. Heaven's such a beautiful place. And what comes through, it's not just a a deep spiritual experience. When you bring joy into a place, you bring heaven into a place. When you bring hope into a place, you bring heaven into a place. When you talk to somebody, when you encourage somebody, when you encourage somebody who's made a mistake, when you lift somebody up, when you inspire somebody who's made a mistake, when you help them get up back on their feet, when you encourage them and not beat them for making some mistakes, that is when you bring heaven into this earth. When you do your best in business, you bring heaven into this earth. When you sit down and draw a picture or design a building, God is the greatest designer you can imagine. somebody who's a gardener. Beautiful. If you're a teacher, if you're one who works with kids, if you're a mum, if you're a grandmother, you're the gate of heaven. You're the house of God. It's your job. It's your role to bring heaven into your kids, to help them come and to grow into the fullness of what God is. That's what it means to be a Christian. 
not just to come a religious practice that you go there, 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 there. That's not what it means to be a Christian. And what it means to be a Christian is simply this, to be aware of the presence of the most amazing and only God who created the heavens and the universe. That despite of all my failings, despite of all the junks in my heart, that He wants to make my heart His home and He wants to put out His love and His life through mine. That is something to be excited about. That's what I'm saying. That's what repentance is. Repentance is not coming before God and saying, Oh God, I'm sorry for oh, giving the birdie to that person. Oh, that's just a wicked thing. So, Lord, I've probably had one or two many beers. Oh, Rob. But it's not me. <laughs> I feel guilty about that. I'm more consumed about what I didn't pray this week. Forget all that. That's condemnation. That's religion. Being aware that the presence of the divine is in your life. And you are the vessel that he wants to pour out his goodness into the world. So if you've uh, got a smoking problem, what are you, well, I'm not going to get you to stand up to your feet. <laughs> but you can just take peace in your heart. Don't you to live under that condemnation. If you've been divorced, yeah, God would still use you powerfully, more abundantly. It doesn't matter. Maybe you've slapped somebody in the cheek or whatever, whatever you've done. What? God ain't angry with you. That's why it's important to come with a heart of repentance. Repentance is simply this. It is simply this. Maybe, maybe you do need to put something right. Maybe you, yeah. It was really bad. You should really put that right. But for most of us and for most of the time, I found this. I've become so consumed with my own self and less aware that His presence is in me and wants to flow through me. That's where I need to come and say, Lord, Help me become more aware of your presence. That's what prayer is. Prayer is not just declaring this, that, and the other thing and praying this, that, and the other thing. In fact, prayer can simply be this. Help me to become more aware of your presence, O Lord. Today, I thank you that you have made my heart, my life, your home. Help me. Today, Father, be aware of your presence everywhere I go. Lord, forgive me where I've been so distracted on things that are unimportant. I've reprioritized your presence right down to the bottom of the list. Help me, Lord, to be the gate of heaven that's open and not just open a peak. That's why we come here on Sundays. That's why I come here anyway experience the presence of the Lord with you. That I become aware out of all the other things during the week that God is God and one day I'll stand before Him but He also wants to work through my life. He wants to fellowship with me. He wants to use me. He wants to demonstrate His goodness through my life. Why don't you just close your eyes and just bow your heads. Father, we thank You for Your goodness. Father, I thank you that in the midst of the desert, that in the midst of pain, that in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of failure, you still want to make your presence known to us. Father, I pray for every household here today. Maybe they're here for the first time. I pray that every person in this place at this moment will become aware of your wonderful, most gracious presence in and around their lives and around their families today in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that our lives would be a gate that's open, a gate of heaven that is open. Father, that our lives would be conduit of hope, a conduit of faith, a conduit of encouragement, a conduit of creativity, your beauty, your, your, your amazing expressions. Why don't you just stand to our feet? 
You are worthy of it all. You know, when I was thinking about this last night, I couldn't help but want to just put my life right with God. I couldn't help but think, oh, gee, I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. Oh, but I want to get my life right with you. <laughs> Lord, I want to repent because I, want, I don't want that gate of heaven to be closed in my life. I want to repent so I can get more aware of your presence. I want to have more of your grace and more of your presence flow through my life. We're just going to sing the song. Let the crowds, the crowds fall down. Yeah. Worthy are you, Lord. Become aware of the presence of God in your life today. here this morning and you've never ever given and trusted your heart to the Lord we're just going to finish now but you're here and you've never entrusted your life to Him maybe you had some ideas of God and what He's like I'm here to tell you this morning that He loves you Jesus Christ gave Himself on the cross for your sin but also that you could live an eternal life that you could carry His presence, that you could be a representative of Him in this earth. Gee, that's worth repenting for. Gee, that's worth getting on your knees every day. If you're here this morning, you need to get your life right with God. We're going to sing this song one more time. Why don't you just take, your, take a moment and I'm just going to close the service. But if you're here, but you want to get your life right with God this morning. As we worship and we close the service, I'd love for you just to come to the front. I'd love to pray with you. You do business with God. If you don't think you need to, that's fine. There's no judgment here. But if you're feeling in your heart that you need to get your life right with God this morning, why don't you take a step of faith and get out? Come to the front this morning. One more time, let's sing. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Come on, if you need to get your life right, just come out.
Father, I thank you for every person here. Thank you for every household here, Father. Pray that this morning, your wonderful grace, your wonderful presence would abide over every home. I thank you, Lord, that is your desire that your presence abides on every heart. Help us, Lord, become more aware of your presence in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, come on, all God's people said, turn to someone next to you. Tell them you are awesome. You're awesome. Thank you, church. We're so glad that you're here today. People's lives being touched. This altar is open. The service is closed. This morning, we didn't have an offering. So the offering bags will be at the doors as you leave if you want to sow in. If you this morning want prayer, we've got our prayer team will be here to pray with you this morning. Our visitor area is also open. If you're a visitor, we'd love to meet you this morning. Otherwise, why don't you take somebody home for lunch this morning?